like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Verses 1 and 2, which we are already familiar with, lay the foundation for the topic that we're going to discuss tonight. The text says, And all the tax, gather, the tax, tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now there are statements that are being made throughout the Gospels by the Pharisees and scribes that Jesus does not react to. And some statements, like the one that he has a demon, is one that eventually draws a response. This is one of those statements that is made that Jesus is finally, maybe he's had enough, I don't know, but he's finally going to respond. And he responds in a way that might seem a little confusing to us because parables were a method of teaching that sometimes were a little bit unusual and even the disciples in Matthew 13 were puzzled that Jesus would try to teach with this particular medium. But if you'll notice in verse 3 that it, the text says that Jesus told a parable. It's singular. And when we look at this, that brings up the question is, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, really one parable? There's nothing between the three that would identify them as, and he said another parable to them, or something like that. You see, there is an integration of the three together, and of course we're focusing on the third, but when we look at the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, there are parallels here that are all a part of the context of what Jesus is going to say. It's a direct link in response to these guys. You know, what were the publicans and sinners thinking when they heard what the Pharisees said? If they heard it, and they probably did, but that would hurt, wouldn't it? But yet, Jesus, in responding, has got a very important lesson to be taught, and it's a lesson that we need to be taught as well. But when we look at all three of the parables together, we recognize that there are some predominant themes. For example, something is lost. We talk about the word that's lost, and it occurs eight times within all three parables. You got a sheep that's lost. You got a coin that's lost. You got a son that's lost. And that's never a good thing. It's not something that you want to lose. And in all three cases, what's lost is valuable. We want to find it again. Did the Pharisees and scribes feel that way? Were they concerned about the fact that something that was valuable was lost? But yet, secondly, we see that in all three parables, that which is lost is found. And that's another word that predominates in all three of uh, the, the parables. Six times you'll find one particular word that is translated found. That which was lost has been found. That particular phrase, by the way, is found twice in the last parable. And then there's great rejoicing. You look at each parable, and when that which is lost is found, then there's happiness. We're happy that the sheep was found. We're happy that the coin was found. And then friends. Friends are invited to share in the joy. And we see that happiness in all three of the parables. And then Jesus, each time, makes a spiritual application. A point about sin is made. Six times the word sin is found in these texts. And repentance is found, coupled with the idea of sin. Three times you'll find the word repentance found. And then there's heavenly joy. Jesus makes a comment about joy in heaven, that the angels are rejoicing over one sinner 
who repents. But we might note that the parable of the prodigal son has no comment about there being joy in heaven, no comment about the angels in heaven. Now, when the parable of the prodigal son is begun, we notice in verse 11 that Jesus says there was a certain man that had two sons. Now, I believe one of our problems, not only the idea of maybe not considering all three together, but it's been named, not by the Bible, but by us, the parable of the prodigal son. But the introduction of this parable is that a man had two sons. And the fact that we call it the parable of the prodigal son leads us to focus on just one son, and the other son gets kind of second billing. But it's a parable about two sons. And so it's important for us to remember that, and important for us to remember that this is being said to the, the, the Pharisees and scribes that criticized Jesus to begin with. Now, in the first two parables, you've got three main characters. You've got a shepherd, you've got lost sheep, and then you've got friends. In the second parable, you've got a woman, you've got a lost coin, and you've got friends. Then in the third parable, you've got four main characters. You've got the father, you've got the lost son, you've got the servants, and then you've got the older brother. The first two parables talk about joy, no joy in the last parable, and it seems to me that the sour disposition and attitude of the older brother replaces the statement about there being joy in heaven. Now, it's been mentioned that the older brother has been hammered pretty good in this lectureship. But you know, there are some positive characteristics found in this parable about the older brother. He stayed with the father when the younger brother deserted the father. He could have exercised the option to leave. He could have done what his younger brother did, but he chose not to do that. He chose to stay. He could have taken his share of the inheritance, ran off and squandered it just like his brother did, but he remained uh, loyal to his father, loyal to the family. Let's give him credit for that. Second, he was one that continued working. The text tells us that when the younger brother came back, the, he was out, the younger brother was out partying, living the high life. The younger brother was in the field, verse 25. He's working. He is that which is apparently not a lazy man, but has a positive work ethic. Well, we give the older brother credit uh, for that. And also, we note that there are five different verses that mention that the father had servants, plural. So he had to have had a degree of wealth, and yet the older brother is still working. Maybe that's the work of the servants, but yet the older brother has that good work ethic, and he's out there in the field doing that difficult work. And then third, we give him credit for being an obedient son. He says in verse 29, I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. Now, you might doubt that. You might question the truthfulness of that, but the text itself doesn't. It's a statement that's made, and when it's being made to the father, the father doesn't say, now wait a minute, son, let's not be stretching the truth here. It's a comment that's not replied to, and so uh, we have no reason to dispute the accuracy of it. He's been a faithful son. He's been doing what his father commanded. And it might even be argued that while he was out working diligently, diligently in the field, obeying his father's directive, you know, his brother is that which is being thrown a party. Well, that's, in his view, just not right. That is not right that this is happening. But let's turn that coin over. There are some negative aspects of the older brother. He was one that quickly became angry. When he comes back from work in the field and he is, hears all the commotion going on, and he inquires about it, and he finds out about the music and dancing, the text says that he became angry. 
There seems to be no careful contemplation about the transpiring events. He reacts. And he reacts negatively. How did the shepherd react when he found the lost sheep? How did the woman react when she found the lost coin? How did the father react with the discovery of the lost son? How did the brother react with the discovery of his lost brother? Anger. He's angry about that. Second, he's stubborn. While the festivities are taking place and all are making merry, according to verse 24, he would not go in. Verse 28, he objects to the party. He objects, objects to the reason for the party. He is not going to go in. He is not going to have anything to do with it. To him, that would be hypocritical. It would be hypocritical to go in there and celebrate with a reason that he vigorously opposes. So he's going to stand outside. Now we pause for a minute and ask the question, what did he think should have happened to his returning brother? Have you ever wondered that? What did he think should have happened? Now it seems to me there are basically three possibilities. One, the younger brother could have been rejected outright. He shows up and the father says, you can turn right back around and go back to where you came. You're no longer welcome here. Maybe that's what the older brother wanted. Or the older brother could have said, all right, let's make him a slave. Let's make him one of my, fi my father's hired hands. I mean, that's what the younger brother had proposed to do to begin with. So maybe the... Older brother would have bought into that and said, yeah, I think we probably could go with that. <clears throat> or maybe, just maybe, the older brother would have said, well, we'll accept him, but only after a period of penance. He's going to have to prove himself to have truly turned his life around. But you know what? With any of those three options, there's one thing that doesn't fit. A party. We're not going to throw them a party. That's not going to work. And then third negative aspect of the older brother, his years of service were not out of joy, but duty. You know, the principle of loving service is not something that we're seeing in him. He was one that was serving the Father not for the right reasons, not for honorable motives, but he demonstrates kind of a grudging attitude, not doing it for the reasons that were noble. And then fourth, he's jealous. He's envious of the fact that his father would do this for his brother when he never did it for him, verse 29. You know, he represents here those self-righteous Jews that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 6. Those that prayed publicly, that gave publicly, that fasted in a public way, all because they were wanting to receive attention and glory and honor from men. After all, this older brother did a lot more than his younger brother did. Why am I not getting the pat on the back? Why am I not being honored? He's jealous about that. And then fifth, he's got a martyr complex. He says, boy, I never got a party. I never was able to make merry with my friends. Yet we're told in verse 12 that the father divided the inheritance among the two sons. And the father points out that everything here is yours. The older brother received his two-thirds of the inheritance and he could have thrown himself a party. He had the money to do it. He had the means to do it. But instead, he wants to throw a pity party for himself instead of have a legitimate party. He was, in fact, living as one of the servants, not as the child of the father. And then six, he was selfish. 
He could only consider what he wanted, what he needed. What concern does he display for the father? You know, we look through this text. Where is the question of the, the older brother saying, my, my younger brother's back, is he okay? Is he safe? Is he healthy? There's nothing like that in the text at all. There's not a hint of concern about the welfare of his younger brother. But most importantly, he was spiritually blind. He's so self-absorbed that he failed to see the big picture of love and forgiveness. The fact that his brother was in a serious spiritual condition. And now it returned should have brought joy to his heart, but that's not what happened. He can't see it. And that's the most important part of the parable as established in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. The Pharisees and the scribes are not seeing it. They're not seeing the importance of someone who's lost being found. Now, I don't know how many of us tonight grew up in the church. I did. And this is a parable that I've known since I was a little boy. And there was always a certain aspect of the logic of the older brother that made sense to me. I mean, you know, he's, he's got a point. According to the older brother, the younger brother should have been rejected, at least at some level. Look at what he's done. Are there no consequences for what he's done? He'll say, first of all, his younger brother squandered his inheritance. Now, according to the text, what has he been doing? He's been out partying. So what do you do for a person that's been out partying and then he comes back? You throw him a party. No, you don't throw him a party. That's what he's been doing. That doesn't make any sense. He squandered everything. You know, Jesus told a parable in Matthew 25 about the talents. And how three different men were given talents. And then there came a time that there was going to be an accounting. The one talent man was rejected for a failure to use wisely that one talent. You can go back to the Old Testament law of which the Pharisees and the scribes were basing their theology and there were consequences for sin. So why not the younger brother? The one talent man was said was rejected by the master when he came back for failure to use wisely the talent. Why not the younger man? You know, I can see some of the logic of the older brother. Well, unlike the one talent man, the younger brother's story is not over. In the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 when the master returns, that's judgment day. There's no more opportunity. But see, this particular parable of the prodigal son, the story of the younger son is not over. And that's why the consequences are those that are not going to be equal with what we see like in Matthew 25. From that point forward, there's hope. Now, there may be some here tonight that continue to beat yourself up over past transgressions. But as long as there's today, there's hope. And what is in the past is that, just like with the prodigal, can be buried in the past and we can move forward. But the old brother, nah, that wasn't an option. He was going to have to pay. You know, when we read church history and especially look at the history of Catholicism and the doctrine of penance, you can see that there was always this struggle. What are we going to do with the sinner? 
But third, the older brother makes the point that the younger brother had been living an immoral life. Are there are no consequences for that. You choose a path of immorality and, and there's not going to be a prize to pay? Matter of fact, he points out to the father that he's been wasting his money with harlots. Now, we don't know if that's really true or not. The earlier text, when it describes uh, what the prodigal was doing, does says he was being wasteful, but it doesn't specify that he was with harlots. So it could be that there's a little inflation of the truth here. But maybe he's right. Let's just assume that he is for the sake of argument. And then fourth, he points out that the younger brother just shows up and the father lays out the red carpet for him. As a matter of fact, according to verse 20, the father is forgiving before the son repents. Well, how does that work? Matter of fact, that's a, a rather, rather troubling aspect of the parable. So it's easy to vilify the brother, the older brother, as being unloving and vengeful. But shouldn't the younger brother be made to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance? That's what John the Baptist expected. Why not of the younger brother? But you know, the father knows how hard it must have been for his young son to come back tail between his legs, humbled, humiliated, pride shattered, heart heavy, and to make that long journey home. To the father, there was a penitent spirit that was being demonstrated just by his walking down that road, coming home. And so the father was one that reached out and loved him and forgave him. Now that's not to say that the younger son didn't express a penitent spirit. He did. Just that he, as he had rehearsed, he did get it out. But the fifth, the uh, older brother has a point in saying that the younger brother disrespected the father. Now when we think about somebody receive an inheritance in ancient times it's not unlike modern times and that is you get your inheritance when the person that named you in the will dies to go to the father and say I want my share in the inheritance is in effect saying I wish you were dead so I could have my part but you're not so give it to me anyway how insulting that would have been to the ancient mind. And then sixth, the older brother has a point in saying that he's faithfully fulfilled his duty as a son and what did he get out of it? At first glance, it would seem that it would have been better to have imitated the foolish and sinful behavior of his brother and then he would have got the hero's welcome. He would have been thrown the party. How does that seem fair? How does that seem right? Brother Mosier points out on page 350 that Tertullian and some other church historians, early church fathers as sometimes they're called, wrestled with this parable and the principle of forgiveness that this parable taught along with other New Testament teachings. You see, when we study church history, we find a very interesting thing that took place. There were intensive periods of persecution. You've heard about these where there would be a knock on the door and the soldiers would say, Lord, say Lord Caesar. And a failure to say Lord Caesar, but a reply, Lord Christ, had dire consequences. You could lose your life, your family, your children's lives, your possessions. But then, when a different emperor would come in, the persecution would back off, 
And guess who filled the churches again? Imagine what it would be like, how you would feel. If you're sitting here in church on Sunday morning, alone, because you refuse to say, Lord Caesar, and as a result, you don't even have a home anymore. You're sitting alone because your wife was killed as a result of your refusal to declare the lordship of Caesar. You're childless this morning because the Roman soldiers killed your children. Then here comes this family, and they sit next to you on the pew, and there's mom and dad and the kids. And you know that when the soldiers knocked on their door, they caved. Lord Caesar, and so the soldiers moved on. How would you feel about that? Can you just accept that? You see, Tertullian and others wrestled with the idea of there not being a price to pay. Because there were Christians that paid the ultimate price by saying, Lord Jesus. So we can see why there might be some problems was just accepting one back. Well, when you think about the older brother, you could just see the conversation with the younger brother. While you were out partying, guess who stayed here and maintained the fort? Me! Guess who kept the place going? Me! While you were out squandering all your money on sinful things, guess who was week after week? Giving sacrificially, in this case, sacrificially to the church. Me! Whose money pays for these lights that you now enjoy? My money! You're sitting in air-conditioned comfort. Well, guess why? Because of guys like me that have stayed here, worked, and gave my money to this church. Guess who spent hours <clears throat> preparing Bible class lessons? Me! And for all this, I get what? Nothing. But you waltz in, and everybody knows why you waltz in. You're out of money. You squandered everything that you had, and now you're broke. And so now you come back. And everybody loves you and everybody embraces you. We throw a party for you. And guess what we're going to do to get you back on your feet? We're going to give you some more money. How is that right? How is that fair? Well, you can kind of see where the older brother might be coming from. And as a result, that leads us to the seventh point of the older brother, and that is he's not sure he wants to be a part of this family anymore. That's the way the father's going to treat him and treat this brother of his. Then if he's not sure he wants to be a part of that family. Therefore, he says, this son of yours, verse 30. But the older brother and any of us that might act like the older brother, fail to see that we had the best life all along. And that's the part that I think that we miss. Here the older brother is kind of bemoaning the fact that this is some good things happening to the younger brother, but he had the best of the best all along. If we fail to enjoy the beauty of the church, the privilege of worshiping God, week after week. And whose fault is that? That's our fault. We have the blessing of being here while he's out doing these sinful activities. We're a part of the family of God and we're doing that 
which we know our God is pleased with. You know, the, the parable is one that gives us an opportunity, as Wade said, the assignment was one that uh, had an interesting twist to it. But let's rewrite the story for a few minutes on our own mind. And imagine, if we can, that instead of the older brother that's presented in the parable, Jesus is the older brother. You know, the Bible teaches that Jesus is our brother, Hebrews 2.12 and 2.17. So if we rewrite the parable with Jesus serving as the older brother, how might the story have changed? Well, first of all, he would have been proactive in trying to keep us from squandering our spiritual inheritance. You know, there's not word one about the older brother trying to dissuade his younger brother from doing this. But yet the New Testament is filled with instruction of Jesus pleading with us to make good choices. We talk about the wise builder and the foolish builder. And the one that hears these words of mine and acts upon them will be like the wise builder. Jesus is pleading with us to make a wise choice. Lay up treasure in heaven where moth or rust cannot destroy or thieves do not break in and steal. Make wise choices with money. Don't do what you're thinking about doing, younger brother. Jesus would have been proactive. He invites people to come to Him. He teaches the meaning of true discipleship. He says that if you got the whole world and lost your soul, it wouldn't be a good trade. Even in Luke 19, Jesus reaches out to Zacchaeus, tax collector, teaching him the way of salvation. Jesus explained to Zacchaeus and others in Luke 19 and verse 10 that the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. If we replace the older brother in the parable with Jesus, we see someone that's concerned about souls and is going to be proactive in trying to head off bad decisions. Now, we could go ahead and say, the younger brother went ahead and made his bad decisions anyway, despite the pleading. And that would be the same of you and I making bad decisions, despite the pleadings of Jesus through the inspired pages of God's Word. Making bad decisions about money, about family, about work, about worship. Despite the verses that teach us otherwise, But yet, Jesus is our older brother, pleased with us to make good decisions. Second, Jesus is our older brother, would be looking for us to return. Imagine how wonderful it would have been if in the parable, the brother is standing shoulder to shoulder with his dad, looking for the younger brother. What a cool family that would be. And so when the younger brother comes up, we got a group hug now. Welcoming back. It's clear that the father was looking for the son's return, but the brother doesn't seem to care. He's out working in the field. He's not uh, anticipating or even caring whether he comes back or not. Jesus was always interested in reaching out to those who want to get their lives back on track spiritually. You know, if you're not in a healthy relationship with God tonight then you need to realize that Jesus is standing there, looking, waiting, hoping, that you'll be like the young son and come home. And if we can draw that particular picture in our mind of seeing Jesus that's there waiting, maybe that's what it would take to come on home. With the younger son, with the prodigal, you know, you got to believe that my father would still take me back. 
And then third, Jesus as our older brother would find great joy at our return. You know, the old, older brother, we were talking about it a minute ago, was angry about the reception given his younger brother. What was a part of the, the third parable that was missing? Do you remember that? With the parable of the lost sheep, there's joy in heaven. The parable of the lost coin that was found, there's joy. But in the parable of the prodigal son, there's not a mention of heavenly joy. But Jesus, as our older brother, along with the heavenly host, would find great joy when a sinner repents. Maybe this is because Jesus knows how horrible and how terrible hell is. No loving person would ever want anybody to go there. And so there's rejoicing. There's rejoicing that yet one more has escaped the horrors and terrors of eternal damnation. You know, we talk about wisdom, and wisdom is one of those important Bible, Bible words. But I'll say this about wisdom. Wisdom in the Bible means seeing things the way God sees them. You are wise when you see things the way God sees them. Now you might have a PhD and you might be brilliant in some discipline or another and be considered wise in the, as far as the world is concerned, but the Bible wouldn't call you wise at all unless you see things the way God sees it. Do you see the church the way God sees the church? you see worship the way God sees worship? Do you see the importance of the family and the roles of the father and the mother play in the family the way God sees it? You see, there are people that the church is, well, something that I'm kind of involved in from time to time. Is that the way God sees the church? No. The plan of salvation, people play fast and loose with what a person needs to do in order to be saved. Is that the way God feels about it? No. Wisdom is seeing things the way God sees it. Jesus, as our older brother, knows the terrors of hell. And we're wise if we understand that there is a great day coming. A judgment day in which we'll all stand before the throne of God and be judged according to the deeds that we've done in the body, whether good or evil. Wisdom is seeing the truth that God's revealed in His Word. But Jesus, as our older brother, would fellowship with us. The older brother in the parable wouldn't even come in. He wasn't going to be a part of the festivities, but Jesus would be one that would accept the penitent sinner, consider them his brother, and welcome him back fully, totally, wholly to the family. Now, I suspect that the Pharisees were willing to accept the sinners and publicans if they repented, but they were always going to be a, a second-class Jew at best. But not so with Jesus. No matter what it is that we've done, even Paul, as the chief of sinners, was one that was fully accepted by a loving and forgiving Jesus. And that's the fifth point, that Jesus, as our older brother, would be accepting and forgiving. That's what he did with the Apostle Paul. That's what the Father did with the Son. That's what Jesus would do with us. You know, the older brother failed to see that he had sinned too. You know, we talk about Romans 3.23, Romans 3.10, that there's none righteous. All have sinned and fallen short. But the older brother with his tunnel vision is failing to see that he's not perfect either. And maybe he hasn't committed the same sins that his younger brother did, but he's certainly not perfect either. But Jesus, as our older brother, would be one who is perfect. And for one who's perfect to accept us 
who are certainly not perfect, is one of the great attributes of our older brother. Because Jesus could reject us because He didn't make any mistakes. He hasn't sinned. We're the ones that did, but what a wonderful older brother we have that's willing to accept us even though we have sinned. And then six, Jesus as our older brother would be our advocate. In the parable, the father didn't need any encouragement to accept back the penitent son. But if he did need some encouragement, he wasn't going to get it from the older brother. Come on, Dad. Let's go ahead and take him back. That wasn't going to happen. But the Bible teaches us, like in 1 John 2, verse 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He stands for up, up for us. He represents us. And then finally, Jesus is our older brother would be understanding and he would be merciful. The older brother considered what the younger brother did inexcusable. But Jesus became man. He understood the power of temptations. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. But he can sympathize with our weaknesses. The Hebrew writer also said in verse chapter 2, verse 17, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That's our older brother right there. Representing us in things pertaining to God, a merciful and faithful high priest. You know, when we look at this ending, rewriting it in our minds with Jesus as the older brother, it gives us a view of the kind of reception that we can expect to receive from Jesus, our Savior. His willingness to sacrifice Himself for us and to welcome us back despite sinful choices that we made is one of the great attributes that we have with Jesus. When we think about an application to this parable, you might find yourself in ways relating to the prodigal and maybe in some ways relating to the older brother. Either way you go, not having the kind of attitude that is acceptable to God, but like the prodigal can come back. And like we rewriting the story, the brother can see the error of his ways and see and turn himself to become a loving and forgiving brother, like we know Jesus is. As we sing this song of invitation, if there is something in your life that is not right tonight, make it right tonight. Because Jesus is one that's standing, waiting, looking, anticipating, hoping. That the one that is not right will make it right tonight. We're prepared to pray for you, to immerse you into Christ. If you've not obeyed, or got, obeyed the gospel through repentance and confession and baptism, immersion into Christ, whatever your need is, let us know now while we stand and sing this song of encouragement.